was one of his ventures with his best friend, Jack, um, called Jagged Edge. So that's where the name of the novel comes from. Um, and it, it's about their connection, but they have some significant um, trauma in both of or each of their separate lives. They have individual traumas that they're struggling to overcome. And again, something that Lily doesn't know is that there is a uh, hidden connection between the two of them that only Ryder knows. And um, it, that that is going to make or break them eventually. Um, yeah, so. I like how you put that. Thank yeah. you. That does that's, a really good job. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's, that's as far as I really want to go into that. Well, that's I why I asked the... you to do that because I have a habit of talking too much and giving too much away. <laughs> so. And I mean, everyone else, you know how you can find out what happens and what the, everything is. You just have to get the book. This is a shameless plug. Okay, so. There's no shame. There's no shame. <laughs> Buy <laughs> the book. <laughs> we'll try to be more subtle later, but probably not. So, um, <laughs> so I did mention, I saw the drink on the table. We've talked a lot about Love on the Rocks. I know you spent a lot of time crafting this cocktail. Why don't you tell us about it and also why Love on the Rocks and how does it Okay, hold on. So first of all, you have to see this because it's hard to see. There you go. But if you can see in there, it's like all sparkling. Just so, ignore my lipstick. Yeah. Okay. So there is a reason. So Love on the Rocks, we decided that as part of this cocktails, and there's of course a double entendre in that, uh, cock being of course, you know, uh, the, 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 the men bits. And then- That's hilarious because I was looking at it the other way, like- cocktails and then tales as in stories no no but that's the other part oh, is that it. tales is spelled of course uh t-a-l-e-s right. so as in a story okay good but then the word cocktail for a drink so I originally we in, okay shut up <laughs> originally we envisioned this as um sort of like a a ladies and gents night in and um what do you do when you have a night in or a night out but since we can't go out we're doing this in is you know you go out for drinks and and stuff like that so um uh so that's where the the idea of cocktails came from so um i was charged with the task of uh creating drinks to go with certain themes and uh concepts that are raised in the book so the first one uh, i i it just came to me out of the air, Love on the Rocks, which is this. Um, so what it is, is of course, there's going to be, you know, trouble in paradise between the, uh, the, the female and the male protagonist in this case. Um, that's again, traditional. And so that's where the concept of Love on the, Love on the Rocks comes from. Um, and then it, it, just, it just made me think of the Neil Diamond song Love on the Rocks from the jazz singer. Yeah. And so because his name is Neil Diamond, we had to create something shiny and sparkly. So that's where I got the idea from. And it was just la last weekend, for example, was, um, it was a good Saturday night while we were taste testing every single combination of, the, uh, of, of alcohols that I came up with till we found one that we liked. Yeah. So that's Love on the Rocks. Well, it looks great. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. It tastes good. Oh, that's good. And we've sent out the recipe and we'll send it out again after the event. So everyone, if you haven't made it at home yet, you can make it at home as often as you would like. And we have a non-alcoholic version as well. So everyone can enjoy. That's right. So let's talk about the tropes of the romance genre. So now we can actually talk about the writing romance part of your writing. So what tropes did you know that you needed to include and how did you make them your own? Well, there's a basic formula. I mean, you read enough of enough novels in the genre. And, and between realize, the two of us, we've read hundreds. Yes. Um, you realize they're, they all follow the basic formula. It's, you know, the rich billionaire, a little bit older, the younger. Ingenue kind of. In, in a sense. Yeah female and you know they meet fall in love the meet cute yes um and then as their relationship progresses and you think it's all gonna work out there is some kind of crisis that threatens the relationship and then it comes around in the end after some turmoil and you know crying and yeah. lots of tears and what it and, and one of the the tropes that may, that changes it from let's say erotica to erotic romance or erotic contemporary romance is that it has a um 
either a monogamous relationship or a, um, uh, a polyamorous relationship, but that it's um, one that everyone agrees to, uh, agrees to. And, um, and then you've got your HEA at the end, you're happily ever after. Yeah, that's essential. Yep. And then how did you, I guess, what was the spin on it that you put it to make it your own, to set it up? Well, usually, you know, the, there are, like we said, obstacles and not only obstacles between the couple, but inner obstacles that the characters are dealing with in order to be able to um, um, move into the relationship and, and, and be accepted and loved. But I and, think that that's actually, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I think that that's actually what makes ours different is that the That's majority right, sorry because no, no, the no. majority of what we what we would read is uh there is a serial killer who is chasing the woman and the guy has to be her knight in shining armor and defend her and save her like whether it's a he's a you know he's a hitman or whatever there's there's always that um Ex male seal right there's always that um in, in and this is in a in a male female relationship um, that it's, uh, there's always the, um, uh, then the man who has to rescue the woman. Um, so one of the things that I think that we identified, uh, consistently, um, it was always the man saving the woman, which drove me freaking mental. And it was always solely from the female perspective, perspective. and mm -hmm. it didn't reflect the inner thoughts and feelings of or the male or yeah. experiences of the male. So those were two things that we really, really changed. We made this less about um, the man having to save the woman and more about them saving, saving each other. Each other. Yeah. And we gave them both personal histories that not only were incredibly traumatic and then changed their lives going forward, but that were conjoined from the beginning and they didn't realize this. Um, and, and also the, the struggles, the, and that struggles, we, we yeah. gave them their individual struggles we felt were unique. I mean, yeah. the fact that Lily suffers from body dysmorphic disorder, when I first, we first started talking about the novel, most people would, their response to that would be, what's that? So it was important to me being diagnosed with that, that I really wanted to bring attention to something that I felt deserved attention and to create a character that other women who are experiencing the same thing could relate to and know that they're not alone. So rather than it just being anxiety, which is still an extremely you know, important issue. I also suffer from anxiety and so does my son, but it was important for, for this, having struggled it with my whole life and feeling like nobody understood what I was going through and feeling like this was, was um, unique to me. I felt like it was important to cast a light on this for other people. Oh, absolutely. So we, and, and none of the books that we had read had ever delved into this particular issue. So that yeah. was really important to me. Yeah, well, I think to both of us, and yeah. uh, you write what you know. Exactly. And so a lot of the the things that happened in the book, uh, they didn't like the events didn't happen to us, but the the background, the development of the characters, uh, the, the a lot character, of that characters' feelings, motivations. Yeah, a lot of that is drawn from things that we've experienced uh, ourselves. So well, and and then of course you know we named all the characters after our family members. <laughs> How do they feel about that? Oh, it depends on which one you ask. Yeah. Um, and remember, this was five years ago. So, you know, my sons were, can I do the math in my head? 16. 16 and, and 14? Yeah. No, 13. 13. 13. So their yeah. views on it now are very different than what their views were when we originally told them how they were being portrayed, portrayed in the... Uh, well, because uh, at the time they were, they were in grade eight. Mm -hmm. So my, young, my younger son and her younger son are yeah. the same age and were in grade eight at the time. At the time. And um, as a result, they were just, they just thought it was hilarious that moms were writing. Um, so they, they yeah. thought it was the funniest freaking thing ever. And so of course, you know, they tell their school friends and that whole, that whole thing was, that was hilarious. They yeah. started a, um, a MILFs list at school. So MILFs is M-I-L-F. Number one. Yeah, she, I, 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 did I crack the top three at least? I think so. I think so. Um, so MILFs list, of course, you can figure out what MILF is and that, there's a, there's a whole other thing with that, but um, yeah, so- That led to a whole other venture. It did, it really <laughs> did. And, and 
So that's, you know, our, our kids, I, I think they took it in stride. Yeah. You know, back then they yeah. didn't really understand really now what it meant. they just are concerned with how many books we sell and how much money we're going to make from it so we can help them buy the things that they want basically yeah. have any of them read it no, no. <laughs> but but mostly because they're not interested but i think some of my younger son's female friends i think at this point because now they're 18 mm -hmm. i think they are starting to like they're getting into it and... yeah they're, they're, they're getting a little curious interesting yeah no i i mean first uh, holiday gift huh Right. But they have to buy it. Yeah. So we're happy to deliver it as a gift, but they have to buy it first. <laughs> um, they, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, I think that, um, they wouldn't terribly be interested in, in reading it. It's just no. not there. Although my husband did, uh, has said that when we get the, the, when the book comes out, he wants to read it. Yeah. And I don't think he's read a book in like 15 years. So. <laughs> well, this will be a good first book then and then he'll see his name appear in it too which is always exciting oh he know he knows so the husband yeah. is a different story yes. because yeah. we've portrayed them in the book as, uh, of course as well and their characterization is very much like the their their existing personalities and their duality together yeah. um because they're friends because they're friends in the book and then of course they're 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 actually friends in real life so yeah Okay, well, that's great. So I'm thinking maybe now would be a great time for you to just give us a little taste of the book. And would you like to read out a scene? So, okay. All, um, all right, sure. So what we thought we would do is that we would um, each read a scene that it, 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 they take place at two different times, but they're the same scene from different perspectives. So um, one perspective, which I'll read first, is the first time that Ryder sees Lily and his reaction. And then the following scene that Cindy will read is um, when Lily sees, uh, sorry, when yeah. Lily sees Ryder for the first time and her reaction. So um, we're going to leave a little bit of the kinky bits out and let you experience those parts yourselves. Uh, uh, sorry, I was just thinking of a really uh, naughty joke at that time. But um, yeah, so it'll give you a little bit of an idea of our style of writing. So this takes place um, near the beginning of the book when Ryder is sitting in his car outside of Jagged Edge offices. He's about to go up to visit his, uh, one of his friends uh, that, that, that owns the, um, the magazine, that runs the magazine. So he's sitting in his car. Uh, okay, here we go. So Ryder had been feeling a bit off today already, what with his conversation with Natalia that morning, and then with fielding one generic fuck up or another at the office. Now, after reading Marty's email, he was downright irritated. Irritation didn't suit Ryder well, leaving him to often make impulsive decisions. Ryder sighed and ran his fingers through his hair, scratching at his scalp. This was a tick that often appeared when he was dealing with minor frustration. <sighs> Jack's projections on marketing better be good. I am so not in the mood to deal with any more issues right now. He snatched up his phone once again and began to text Jack that he was downstairs and would be up in a moment. As he was typing, movement outside of his window caught his attention and he looked up. Standing in front of the car, staring at him, well, okay, more likely she was just staring at the car, was a woman wearing a short white summer dress and she immediately captured Ryder's full attention, halting his texting fingers, leaving them, ho leaving them hovering over his phone's keypad. Ryder gasped, clamoring for breath as the air in his lungs had all but evaporated. The woman in front of him stood resolutely, if only for a moment. A slight breeze wafted through her long, russet hair, exposing her creamy, pale shoulders. Her mouth, pink, full and luscious, was slightly open. Her cheeks bled with the intensity of her blush. To Ryder, this woman was every spectrum of visible color, exploding in front of his eyes, her beauty absolutely piercing through his soul. Ryder's heart began to throb, a sensation with which he was completely unfamiliar. Much like one feels the pulsing of adrenaline, Ryder felt his heart lurch into his throat and begin pounding, choking him into near oblivion. Under his breath and not even realizing his inner monologue was suddenly audible, he whispered to himself, she's stunning, who is she? He stared at the woman, his eyes burning into her, willing her to see beyond the tinted glass and to notice him. Suddenly, he was Narcissus, 
enraptured with the image of his own beauty. Such was the longing and passion that instantly consumed him when he saw her. His eyes felt dry, suffering the excruciating need for him to blink moisture back into them, but he simply couldn't turn away his gaze from her miraculous face. Oh, it's so good to hear it out loud. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and so Cindy will uh, follow up. Okay, so this is a little bit later, but it's the first time that Lily encounters Ryder. But Ryder didn't even acknowledge Jack. In fact, he was quite rudely pushed past him and held out his hand to greet Lily, gripping her slight hand firmly, unheardly, for far longer than common courtesy generally dictated. Lily held, Lily held onto Ryder's extended hand, completely unaware of the passing of time. She was utterly transfixed by Ryder's powerful physique and beauty. She could sense immediately the powerful presence Ryder radiated. Holy shit, <laughs> Lily thought to herself. I thought Jack was hot, but this guy? Fucking hell, he's gorgeous. A bolt of adren adrenaline shot its voltage straight through Lily's stomach, landing precisely at the junction of her legs, causing her to involunta involuntarily clench her thighs together. As she did, her insides convulsed with the pleasure of a fleeting mini orgasm. Lily began, became acutely aware of molten warmth and sudden wetness building between her legs. Her nipples seized their appreciation of this sumptuous sensation by tightening and erecting into hard bullets. Apparently, this morning's earlier fantasies of her faceless, faceless knight furiously fucking her were much closer to her conscious awareness than she realized. Her knight was no longer faceless. It was him. Wow. Well, I mean, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I got the part. <laughs> Did. She did, and that's that's not even remotely as close to uh, as 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 erotic as it gets. That's just um, that's just you know si simply the the like you said the tip of the iceberg there. <laughs> or, yeah, it's so great to hear it out loud. It it makes a very big difference. Oh, thank you for reading for us. Thank you. So okay, hearing it again really makes me wonder. How do you write a good romance? Because I think we all know when romance is done poorly. There's a title that you mentioned at the beginning that, <clears throat> anyways, um, 50 Shades, 50 Shades. But <laughs> how do you write romance well? Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm still thinking. Uh, okay. Um, I think, again, one of the things that it comes down to is that you do have to follow the certain set of uh, stereotypical tropes because that's what engages your reader. Your reader um, will have a set of expectations that, that, that if they're not there, they, 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 they're not interested in, in the book. Um, so it, it does start with that. But I think that what's really important is that you have to make your characters absolutely believable. And relatable. And relatable. So even if the guy is a billionaire, he still has to have a, a sense of humility and flaws, um, and flaws that, that make him, yeah, relatable Human. to, yeah, to, to some extent. He has to come across not as um, untouchable. And, and you have the reader, who is usually female, yeah. needs to fall in love with him. That's right. Um, so the, the, the things that you throw in afterward are just sort of eye candy. Um, but ultimately, it, it, I think what really it comes down to is that your characters have to represent two halves of a whole. And they need to fit together like, like, like puzzle pieces where they just, you know, slide into each other, pardon the expression. Um, and and that, that connection is strong enough to get them through even uh, really serious uh, the, the troubles and um, things that we throw at them. I think the key is that, at least for me, when I read the books in this genre, it's like I have to be able to identify with the female character and, and live vicariously through her and fall in love with the male character. Yeah. And then that's the whole point of reading romance is you're being taken out of your reality and you're being put in this world where you're living through the, this character and you're experiencing all of the, the romance and the things that 
you've always kind of fantasized about. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that happens in these books, you you as a as 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 a mere mortal can't experience right. uh, in real life. So it is um, it is a love. There's a huge level of fantasy to it, um, and I think that's that's part of what drew me into it. Actually, into the genre itself was um, was that fantasy and being able Same. to experience yeah. things Absolutely. that I wouldn't have otherwise experienced normally. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. And then I always come back to your characters because what I love is that you honestly have like three dimensional, relatable characters that even aside from the protagonists or secondary characters are spectacular. So can we just take a moment to talk about Miller and Will <laughs> oh my God. explain who they are and just, I mean, that's such, a, you know, the magic of your writing is that it's just so much more than the romance itself and you throw in so many other things in there. And so let's We're talk. planning on actually giving Miller his own book at some point. Well, most of, I think all of the secondary yeah. characters are going, the, well, the idea is to Yeah, the idea was that. to create these characters and have the reader, in, you know, connect with these characters so that we could then extend the series and, you know, give several of them their own books. Yeah, so Miller, um, again, keeping in mind that this is um, a world of fantastic occurrences, um, Miller is the doorman at a very posh um, uh, downtown Toronto loft where Lily lives with her roommate, Willow. And we explain how someone who has the job that she has can afford and it. earns the salary yes. that she earns, how she can afford to live there. Yes. So... Um, mm -hmm. Did we say it, or did we not say yet that Lily she works in publishing? Yes. Anyway, yes. Most, okay, good, good, good. Yeah. And and and, so, and that's how she met Willow is that they well actually no they, they met in university but they wound up um in the, like in the same uh, um, uh, program field the same field. program yeah and well different different programs but in the wider same right field. and so yeah. then they wound up working together um at the same job and it made made a lot of sense for them to to live together so they're roommates in a very exclusive loft downtown that actually exists and um the place is fantastic um miller is the doorman there miller is flamboyantly flamboyantly gay but and sweet and that's the thing thoughtful like, and kind he and is he he's is like their big brother he he is but he's their sassy gay best friend yeah so yes it's stereotypical but he he works that to his advantage so when he's it um, empowers him it does and when he's with the women he can be himself and he can be effeminate and he can uh talk about how you know, he loves their heels and he wants to borrow their scarves from each other. Um, whereas when he's confronted with male visitors, let's say when Ryder comes to the condo one time to the lot, um, he's all very- The big brother kicks in. Right. Um, so he is a very unique character in the sense that he's, um, I, as you said, he's not just uh, a, a, like, um, you know, two-dimensional, where he's he, multifaceted. He, he really is multifaceted, but he's he's very much um, a person that you want to get to know, and uh, he's who be you want with. as your best friend. He really is. Yeah, he really is. He was so much freaking fun to write, and he's based on um, some people that I think we both know. Um, a, a culmination of a whole of, bunch of correct personalities. Correct. Um, yeah. So he's uh, he's just a delightful character. Um, as we were rereading the the scenes in the book, we expanded we his it, part. We did expand his part a lot. Yeah. But um, I remember texting Cindy several weeks back saying, "I forgot how much I love Miller." So yeah, yeah. So, such a great character. And oh, sorry, I think I cut you off. No, no. I was just going to say, as we're approaching 741, for everyone that's with us, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A box, because we will turn to them whenever you're ready. Um, but yes, I'm so glad that not only that you wrote Miller, that we get to read him. So, so great. So great. So as we're waiting for questions to come in, I have a couple more that I would love to pick your brain about. How did you learn what was working and what wasn't while you were writing? Reading out loud. Yeah. If we cringed, we knew everyone else was going to cringe. Okay. So I think we need to take a step back and explain the history of the book. Oh, so we okay. originally wrote this book 
five years ago um, as a different book com almost completely. Oh, right. Um, we self-published it, but not really, like we didn't do anything with it. We just had a bunch printed up um, and it sort of went nowhere. So um, a friend of ours, a mutual friend said, hey, you guys should make this into a movie. So we said, hey, great idea. So we sat down, I taught myself how to write a oh, screenplay. Sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt people one second. Originally with the first novel, it was written as to be the first novel in a series of three. Right. Because again, at the time, that, that was, was the, the, trend. the trend. Fifty Shades and other authors yep. were, Sylvia Day, um, they were doing multi-novel series. Yep. So the original series, sorry, the original book um, wasn't really a complete story as far as the big picture for us. Right. Because we intended on writing two more novels to finish telling the story. Right. So, so what happened was I, I sat down and basically taught myself how to write a screenplay. I mean, I knew the basics, but um, I, I needed, uh, there, there, there's a lot of specificity for when you do a, a screenplay. Um, like there's spacing of this and, and, and anyway. Um, we started writing it. And the more that I was writing and then contacting Cindy and saying, this isn't working. And then we'd write another part and then, yeah, this isn't working we realized that part of the problem with it was that you couldn't write this three book series um, as, a, as a movie. It wasn't working out. It was dragging on too long. Um, and it, there wasn't enough to really say in, 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 in it. So we decided to combine all the idea of all three books into the movie, into the screenplay. And we did, we wrote an entire screenplay yeah. um, that we, got so much attention for and won so many yeah. festival awards from like indie festivals and even um, some major festivals around the world. Uh, we won in uh, Oaxaca. There's a major film festival there. We there was won, one in Toronto. There were two too. in Toronto that we won. Um, a couple in, and there was one in Scotland, several in Europe, it, all over the world actually. It was quite interesting, but um, we got so much great feedback yeah. on it and so much success from it. We're like, why don't we re rewrite the book? And yeah, to, to tell the whole story. Match in the, the screenplay. Shot. Yeah. So that was what initiated the, the, the whole the rewrite. Whole, the whole rewrite. And because originally, can we say into, originally what it was called? Can we say? Yeah. The whole rewrite into Jagged Edge. Right. And um, yeah, so that, that initiated that. And then, so what we did was we took the screenplay next to us on one side, the, the old version of the story on the other, and we started amalgamating them. And then as we read through it, we're like, yeah, this isn't working. Fine. We wound Some up, time had passed in between we wrote Well, we wound up putting the it away. Book. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, you know, a couple of years. For a couple, couple of years, years, we put it away. Fresh perspective, age, you yeah. know, um, um, more experience. You know, we realized that some of the language, some of the dialogue, some of, <laughs> you know, the details yeah. needed to be changed and updated so we and and like like cindy said it was it, it, we were cringing as we read it uh and this was just recently within the last several months as we were preparing it to to be officially published as this new novel just cringing at what we wrote thinking yeah. oh my god this is this is this is brutal this is you know, we would never write that now and again that's yeah. because of our experience evolution and, as writers right Right, so, huh. thank goodness. It's much better now. Yeah. Well, it's a really great book and that's really helpful to know. Okay, so we're getting some questions coming in. So first from Sean, not a question, more of a comment. He says, very proud of both of you, congratulations. Thank you, honey. That, that's her husband. <laughs> Um, and we have a question from Elan Feiner. Loving the discussion around the novel's formation, I have to ask you both, who was your favorite character to write about? Oh. Um, I, I really... I can tell you who I hated writing about the most. Oh, who? Okay, so there, there's one character that you'll read about and... Uh, and you'll is, hate him too, don't worry. And he's, he's designed to be hated. Yes. Um, I think that I, I, I particularly enjoyed writing Miller, as I said. Yeah, that was fun. Um, but I also really liked writing, there's, a, there's another series of secondary characters, um, Willow the roommate, and then they, they have two, room, um, two uh, uh, 
men that are roommates that move into the loft next to them. And I think that developing their relationships yeah. um, with Willow, that was delightful too. I think that they had a lot to say and I'm really looking forward to developing them some more as well. Um, I do think Lily was the most intricate character to write, the, the most multifaceted and, and important to write because of the things that she experiences. And we didn't want it to be melodramatic it had to be realistic. realistic. So drawing on both of our experiences, um, yeah. she's really an amalgam of, of, of both of us yeah. to a large extent. For me, it was definitely Lily because it was cathartic because yeah. I was able to finally, after so many years, purge every feeling and thought and insecurity and issue that I've ever struggled with out and I think in the end, it was kind of like therapeutic for me. Yeah. I think that it, it, was, it was great therapy for me. Well, she identifies now. Like, she, Cindy, I, I find that I never talked before about this, it she before. would never talk about it. There was always these issues, but um, nothing yeah. that she would particularly understand enough to even speak about until we well, started to research it. I, and, I thought that if I talked yeah. about it, people would just think that I was vain and self-absorbed and all I cared about were my looks. I didn't understand yeah. that what I was feeling was legitimate. Yeah, I think we both discovered, um, and thank you, uh, Ilan, for the, um, for the question, because yeah. I think it's a really important one. I think yeah. we both discovered as we were creating the characters and as they were developing and we were changing them, that they were reflecting more and more of us. Mm -hmm. And I think both of us, we've come to understand a lot about ourselves in the course of writing this and the strength that we gave Lily I think we learned to adopt for ourselves well <laughs> no <laughs> maybe in so. part I, I think, think she so. did uh, no I think you too but but we did find some truisms yeah. uh, about ourselves yeah. hmm uh, right. great, question and great answer. So now we have a question from Tracy. Uh, <laughs> we've had a long debate about this for five years. We've been debating about this. Okay. <laughs> we, this is the, so as when we write and, and people have always asked how did two people, you know, write a book together. And I mean, <laughs> we can talk long, long, long about that, but we've always been on the same page, except oh, for wait, question and answering. Oh, sorry, Tracy's question. If this was to be made yeah. into a movie, who would you cast as the main characters? Um, this is the one, the only time we have ever differed in this entire process. Oh, you know, yes and no, but we, like, you've always she, had your... she fancies certain people yes. and I fancy yeah. other people. So, yeah. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd cast Benedict Cumberbatch in anything. But um, he could be Miller for all I care, it doesn't matter. But, um, it... So I, I originally, I envisioned um, the, the, the writer to be um, uh, uh, Henry Cavill, um, who is just, he's like my hunk of hunk of burn in love. Yeah. No. Um, absolutely gorgeous British actor. Um, he's got bum chin. He is so, so sexy. He's the guy who played Superman in the, in the last remake of the Superman movies in the Marvel movies. Uh, sorry, uh, DC movies. Um, I, I would like Henry Cavill. And... Uh, originally, but we did agree on Lily. Uh, Who did we agree on for Lily? Uh, Demi Lovato. You did? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. And originally you said Chris Pratt for Ryder. No, we both said Chris Pratt. But this was like back in 2000, what was it? 2015. 2015 yeah. You know, when he was popular. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm undeclared. I don't, I don't know. Or I, I would have to... I uh, scope out, you know, the possibilities. Yeah. And, you know. I still see Daniel Radcliffe as as, as, as Marty's character. Oh, and we said to play to play my husband's character, to play Sean Seth MacFarlane. Yes. Yeah. Because my husband is the comic relief in the book. Yes. What a diverse cast. What's that? Like what a diverse like range of actors. Oh yeah, all different ages. All different. Everyone in this one movie. No, but it's awesome. Yeah. 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 Great question. Great question. <laughs> Okay, I have to ask, so how did you co-author this book? Can you tell us, please? Well, it started off um, in sitting in Tam's office with her laptop in front of us, and she did all the typing, and, you know, we would just, she would start a sentence, I would finish it. I would start a sentence, she would finish it. We really found it very easy 
Um, we yeah. always seem to be on the same page. If she was thinking, what's that word? What's that word? For some reason, you know, know I'd know it. Or if I was struggling with something, and like I said before, we have very different strengths, right? Yeah. So Tam's very technical. Um, she's very um, rational thought and logical thinking and great at research. Whereas I'm more about, but this is what she'd be feeling right now. And this is what she would say Which right now. Which is some of the stuff that I don't, I can't normally access because I don't quite have that same sort of emotional side yeah. to me. So I would say, and you can disagree with me, but I think probably about 90 percent of the novel we wrote word for word together yeah. and it was later on in the process when we were rewriting and we needed to add in more scenes and we decided to develop this character or that that we would then go off and you know I would write a couple scenes or Tam would write a couple of scenes, and then we'd send them to and each other send them to each other for feedback and most of the time it was yeah. maybe a word choice here or there yeah. or something really basic or simple but it just, that seems to be such a popular question. We've gotten that right from the start from, from everyone, yeah. yet it was the simplest thing for us. It and, was and, never an issue. Yeah, and genuinely we would sit, as we are right now, side yeah. by side, um, whether it was in the office or on my deck outside. Oh, and the nice weather outside. Uh, in the sure. nice weather outside, and we would write, but it was essentially what you see right here. And yeah. Typing, 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 and, and, and arguing and bantering and so it was, teasing it was, and, it, and it was, it was that 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 banter that led to oh my god, some of the funniest stuff that ever happened. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I'll tell them about where. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so there's this one scene where Ryder and Lily are having sex, uh, or at the time anyway, and um, Cindy couldn't quite visualized she was what I to was me, trying to do. Right. And and I and she was telling me like and I'm like, but what, what what do you mean his arm was here but her head was there? And, right. And she couldn't picture I, it. I could, I'm a visual person. I need to see things. So we decided to 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 make that visual uh in my mind a reality. So, so she I says, said, Okay, get up, okay, stand so get up, up, bend over the desk, put your did. hands here, and then on and he he would reach around her like this. So and like I she got had her hands her in front and of I me. And, came around and yeah. I literally had my hands on her boots. And then and as we're doing that, so we're in uh my office, uh, my home office, which has glass French doors. Which were open. Which were open, of course. And as we're doing that, our 14-year-old at the time, 14-year-old sons, walked by. And they see this, they stare at us like, moms, like, like, what are you doing? Oh my God, we just looked at them and laughed. Yeah. And they, they're going to like tell our, their dads and yeah. I'm sure the dads were basically thinking, hey, let's go join. <laughs> it was, it was priceless. And there yeah. were so many um, things that came out of writing together and doing the research. But it was just, it was so natural was, and organic. Was. And yeah. it was just, it was almost like we had all of this stuff bottled up inside of us. And once we opened, you know, the gateway, it, it was, was well. just, yeah, it just kind of like came out and, and yeah. it, we were just really always on the same page. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. That's so cool. Because as I was reading it the first time, I kept thinking, you know, I didn't know how you wrote it initially. So I was like, okay, at what point will I know who wrote what? Right. You're, you thought you'd see a shift in writing style, that, right? Too. Like, oh, did you write the first half and yeah. you wrote the second half? And it wasn't like that at all. But that's also why if I wrote a scene, I gave it to Tim. And when she wrote a scene, she gave it to me. Yeah. So that we could get the, you know, both of our style word choice, you know, thought process involved. Yeah. So there wasn't that kind of up down and, and discrepancy in the writing. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's very even throughout. So it's incredible. So I very much trust your writing process. So yeah, very, very cool. And I uh, think it's just amazing, though, that after that experience, and it, it took friends. us about, right, but it took us about what, <laughs> April, May, June, yeah. July, August, September, it took us about six months to write the, the first version of this. Um, and basically, we, we haven't been apart since. Yeah. Yeah, we really haven't. That's we're yeah. man, like we're like we're like married BFFs. She's like right? my work wife. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so great. Okay. And after that, you know, came the screenplay and a sitcom and a full length drama. So, you know, yeah, we've, yeah, done, yeah. we've written other things as well. well I don't but you are still very happy with each other because I think there's a lot to come. So Yeah. Yeah. All people. <laughs> yeah. 
for now. So as we're approaching the end of our time together, I think a great way for us to leave off is if you can give one piece of advice to anyone that is trying to write their own romance, what would it be? Um, you know what? I don't think it's necessarily true to romance um, per se, because we've already sort of uh, discussed the keys that we've experienced and found and uh, and worked, identified what works work. in terms yeah. of writing romance. But in terms of writing, I, I think there's a few things that you need to think about. First of all, you have to write what you know. If yeah. you don't know something, do not write it. It's because not be authentic it, it won't or be believable. authentic. It won't be believable. Um, yeah. Um, another thing is, you know, just whether it's through stream of consciousness or whatever, just write what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you, where you think you want it to go, and then put it away. Let it chill for however long you have to, whether it's a week, a month, or a year, um, and then revisit it. Come back to it, you know, completely, uh, almost like blind to it now. And if you're reading through it going, wow, I still really like this, then it stays. And if you're reading this and going, it just goes. Um, I think that's what, 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 really worked for us. And you have to write what you're passionate about. Yeah. Because otherwise the the passion, if you don't have the passion, then there's going to be no passion in your writing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have passion for what you're writing, no one else is going to have passion for what you're writing. Oh, yeah. such good. There's, there's one more thing that I will say. In order to write well, you need to read well. Absolutely. So uh, it was Stephen King who said that what he does is he reads four hours a day and then he writes four hours a day. And that is one of the most yeah. important things that, that, that I've, I've ever heard um, in terms of the writing process is yeah. um, you have to read. If you, if you can't read or if you don't read, choose not to, your writing is likely going to be shite because you don't have the, the knowledge or the experience. Um, and you to learn things together. from other and you writers. Do. You learn you what, what, what works what and works, what, doesn't. what doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Um, Excellent advice. Well, thank you both so, so much. This was such an incredible evening and so much fun. Truly the best company on this Thursday night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to everyone as well that joined us this evening. It was a pleasure to have you with us and thank you for all of your thoughtful questions and comments throughout the event. If you haven't done so yet, I highly encourage you to check out Jagged Edge on the Soapbox's website and pre-order your copy. You will not regret it. Um, so you just the, the uh, website, the address? Oh, yes, yes, I'll drop the link in the chat right now and we'll be launching the book on December 18th. So make sure that you mark your calendars and keep your eye out for event information. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's event, then join us next week at the exact same time, also on Zoom, of course, for our second session on body image and mental health. And we'll also have mental health professional Jana Kuminska joining us. The following week on November 19th, we'll have our third and final session called After the Honeymoon, all about the secrets to sustaining a happy and healthy long-term relationship. And if you can't wait a whole week without seeing us, then join the Soapbox tomorrow on Friday, November 6th at our monthly TSB First Fridays open mic. All event information can be found online. Thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. By the book. Thank you. <laughs> oh, where can we order a copy? Yes, there's a link in the chat. Excellent. Everybody, go link in the chat. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.